So I'll get you guys another day. Hopefully this will work. You ready? Want to learn a little bit today? Hey, let's first look at these. So let's learn, let's review. Band people, if this is new for you, maybe just listen carefully. But this one is a really important question on John Slidell's mission to Mexico. He's a Slidell. So maybe you got a weird way of remembering it, but John Slidell, understand that diplomatically we had tension with Mexico already. You vaguely recall the tension stems from the Texas thing, like we annex Texas and Mexico's like, oh no, you can't do that, that's still ours. So Slidell's over negotiating to confirm the Texas thing, and then we offered to buy California and the New Mexico territory. So just this is critical to understand. He makes the offer to buy California. He does not make a declaration of war in person to show the serious nature of Polk. Polk is more sly the way that he's going to, to get that war started. So remember that Mexico outright rejects this Slidell mission and then how is Polk kind of crafty in getting war started? He says, I, I'll really just march. We march south until south. Mexico shoots at our troops. And then what does Polk say? Spill American, American blood, blood on American, American soil. soil. American what? blood on American soil. That is a quote that I ask that you remember. So we march south, they shoot at us. American blood, American soil. War begins. So that's a big question. And as all this negotiation is happening, there's a plan to already like phase out slavery. Hopefully you got this. Eh, will not proviso. So just understand, negotiations were going on where we knew we were about to get a bunch of territory. That thing passes the House, but it does not get through the Senate, so it's symbolic of the increasing divide between the North and the South. This will not proviso failure, the South not only wants to keep slavery, now they're like wanting it to spread is what this thing is showing. And the North is obviously going more abolitionist. They don't want slavery in the territories. That one makes sense to you? Wilmot Proviso on every single test, you gotta know Wilmot Proviso. What is not part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? It's not set at the Nueces. Where is the southern boundary? The Rio Grande, very good. This is a good question. All the following were adamantly opposed to the Mexican-American War except Definitely the conscious Whigs, they hate the war, they have a conscience, they don't like slavery. Abraham Lincoln is opposed to the war. In fact, Abraham Lincoln thinks the war is unjust and controversial. What's Abraham Lincoln's big thing? Spot resolution. Spot resolution. Henry David Thoreau, what? Yeah, he does something. He refuses to pay his taxes. He's practicing what he preaches. Henry David Thoreau goes to jail because he doesn't like his tax dollars supporting this unjust war. Whereas Southern Democrats love the war. Southern Democrats are pro-slavery expansionists and that's what the war is. Pro-slavery expansion war. Make sense? And how you doing on your elections? That's pretty trivial, pretty simple. Yeah, you could miss it now, but Polk's in 1844, Taylor's in 1848. There are tricks, there are ways to remember all of this, but it might be challenging for you now. And by the way, if you're challenged with this stuff now, did you see my revision up here? So if you're challenged with this stuff now, check out my revision. And I had to do this because of your like weird junior day that they have, which I guess I had that on an email, but I didn't even know about junior day. So yeah, I had planned your reconstruction essay on junior day. So now I moved that a day earlier. It'll be on the Wednesday and then you do your junior thing on the Thursday. So whatever, you got that essay, you'll be fine, I'll structure it, you'll know what's going on, you'll have a rubric in advance. You might just have a little extra legwork at home to read something on Reconstruction. Fun preview, I think it's something I wrote on Reconstruction. So yeah, I might include that uh, in the reading. So there's that. And as for the simple memorization of elections, check this out. Remember your final exam, it's not like on the normal final exam date because Lone Star's schedule is different than the school. So I can't cram it all into one day, so I've got two days for your final. I've got our normal 50 questions, multiple choice, thinker questions, all the following are true except, blah, 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 all your content. But then my gift for you all 
is 25 matching questions over simple trivial things. Where Cameron, thank you for volunteering here. I could have a simple matching what? like, oh, I thought you were volunteering. Volunteering for what? Answer a question. So I could have like a simple matching <laughs> section of all these key election years and you get like 1800 and then you match that up with? Jefferson. Jefferson. And I could give you another really key election year, like 1824, and you match that up with? Adams. Quincy Adams. So those are trivial, simple. You easily can get 25 out of 25. You just got to do a little simple memorization. This is not deep thinking all the following except, but I, I think it's necessary to know that. So it should be a booster for your grade, but if you're still like, I didn't even know there was an election in 1800. That could be a problem for you. So just heads up, that's on there. I added this. Would it and be like who had the shortest term? Who had the shortest term? Uh, totally could be a fair question. Yeah. And I, I think I mainly have all of this in matching, where I have a president matching section. I have a key year matching section. You want a key year to see if you can do it like this? Yeah. yeah. 1607. Yeah, it's see how easy that Is should that, be? Can I get it right? You did? <laughs> Jamestown. Did you, is that what you said? Um, another really key year that. Well, I was thinking president. Yeah, but I, I can do key years from the very beginning. Ooh, 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 ooh. Calum. Yeah. Key year. You ready? 1763. No, salutary neglect. Salutary neglect. French and Indian War ends. Do, Proclamation do one, line. Do one for me. One for me. 1776. We got our independence. Kind of, yeah. We declared independence. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, one other quick note on my calendar. I've been getting some emails from you guys like, I don't know where any of the classwork is. Therefore, I have not done any of the classwork. Look. Yeah. I, so, like, if you click classwork, hey, there's, like, everything we've done. 146 assigned. Yeah, but that's like the, the that's the next one. I was amazed when I saw three people have turned this in because it's not due until November 17th. <laughs> so that's the next checkpoint, by well, the way. I need to do that this weekend. So you might want to this yeah. weekend, but hey, hey, look, the next checkpoint, November 17th, that's not this weekend, that's next. If you were to click, you have the rubric for the individual essay. And if you're doing the individual essay, I ask that you read the rubric and then look at what I require for the checkpoint and then kind of figure out where you're going to get your outside evidence. Heads up, I don't take Wikipedia. If you're citing Wikipedia, I will dock you. But you can use Wikipedia as a springboard. Like, where are the quotes coming from? Then use that and you're okay. Yes? Uh, if you have a zero for that first checkpoint, but you turned it in, would you mind checking that for me? I mean, I, it's an easy fix. If you did it, it's, uh, it's on here. Okay. You sure I typed in a zero for you? 110% sure. Okay. I'll look. I, mean, I have a question. Yes? So if we take our final on December 13th, uh -huh. you said, um, do we have like another? Yes. Test? You have a tomball thing, but the tomball thing is jumping through a hoop. And then I add points to your other final. I'll explain that later. Please don't be actually um, it's it's taking like an EOC preview. Like, I just imagine Mr. Taylor <laughs> No, I have to do something. It will be something. It's not bad, and I will just give you points for doing it. But you're just going to have to jump through the hoop and do it. So it's not terrible. Might not be the most enjoyable thing ever, but it's not awful. You want to learn? I feel like I'm missing three people. Julia. Abby, Dana. Abby, yeah, she's out. Julia. Matthew, why isn't Matthew here? Ugh. All right, let's learn. Andrea, too. Andrea, too, thank you. Wait, were you the leader for this class? Whoa. Yeah. Can you see well, all my absences? That's what that means. I got, like, I'm not even saying, I got, like, no. the I don't think you can be gone. We left off here, and we basically left off with the California thing. So just understand, we left off with everyone rushing into California, and this will be the bulk of my lecture today, is explaining the compromise of 1850. So just understand that. I'll get you there, yeah. Is that by Henry Clay? If, well, of course it's by Henry Clay. He's suffering from tuberculosis and is close to death, 
but he's still able to broker this compromise. Okay, so just understand again, we left off with hundreds of thousands flocking into California, and when hundreds of thousands flock into California, California seeks admission as a state. But here's the issue with California. Where does it fall on that 3630 line? In the middle. Ah, oh, it's in the middle. So there's going to be a big old debate. Um, we'll see how complicated that gets over like the, the 1850 and 1851, and we'll, we'll kind of tell that story. But just understand that in terms of Henry Clay compromises, in your head, can you quickly go through his big three? No, because they always get shut down. Okay, so here's the thing with Henry Clay's compromises. That's his third one. What's his first big compromise? The Missouri one? Good, the Missouri compromise. That was 1820. So Henry Clay gets that Missouri compromise. He gets that 3630 line. And that was one about slavery, right? Well, that is about slavery. But what's his one from 1833? The tariff. Henry Clay solves the tariff issue, and then that's his third one. Good? Okay. So you need to know your compromises. I think that you got to go in depth on that. And if you're taking an AP test, you can have your decush moment if you're not. They could easily turn that into an essay question, where they'll be like, to what extent do these compromises keep the union together? And then you go through like how we're about to fall apart before each compromise, and then Henry Clay saves the day. But then you answer, to what extent do they contribute to the Civil War? Are they just delaying the inevitable? Are they putting a, a Band-Aid on a gushing wound? Probably. And that's the way that you could explain it. So again, we can just look at this on the surface. We can check it off. But APers, I know that a couple of you did sign up. I'll review with you come April. But uh, they could ask something like that, and you get to write a couple pages on it. So that's why fun. Didn't, why didn't they just make California split it up? In North California and South Carolina. There were ideas, but they didn't, California wanted to be California. So what was the compromise today? That's my bulk today. So here's the compromise. Let's kind of go through, and here's the thing. California wanted to be together and wanted to be free. So they seek, uh, you know, statehood. They write their own constitution, and they condemn slavery. So California was like, we want to be a state. We want to be a free state. Is it as simple as that? No. The South flipped out. The South is like, no, you can't do that. It's going to be below the 3630 line. We need to keep slavery. Blah, blah, blah. And like the South actually decides to meet in Tennessee. And these fire eaters, these are the crazies that are threatening to secede on the spot if California goes free. And we're talking like 170 something delegates are meeting, are talking, and are threatening to secede if California goes free. But fortunately, Henry Clay is still alive. Henry Clay is able to say, calm down, South. I will give you something, and then you guys will be OK. But just by fire eaters, I mean extremists. Extremists that want to break away the South because they don't want to see California free. That's kind of making sense? So Henry Clay will play a big part, but we got some other old timers in the mix that are also going to play a key role. Good, good, good. Here are our old timers. They should look somewhat familiar to you. Old time Henry Clay. Old yeah. and getting kind of crazy. Jackson. John Calhoun. Jackson's dead. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is Clay and Calhoun. You were introduced to them in 1811, well, by the way. Crazy the entire time. Well, you wait till you see his idea here. And they say this guy plays a critical role. He's the greatest speaker. In fact, they say his speech in front of Congress was the best ever delivered. Like the best speech ever. You know who that guy is? He's a Whig. He's from the North. He's a speaker. Blah. That's Daniel Webster. So anyway, Henry Clay's doing his thing. Henry Clay's able to do his thing because what's his home state? Kentucky kind of in the middle, in the north and the south. So he is able to understand northern interests, but Kentucky is a slave state. So he's like, I understand that. I understand that. Let me be the man in the middle, and I'll come up with some stuff. But Daniel Webster, his 7th of March speech, they say that it was so clear, so convincing, it made everyone willing and ready to compromise. 
In fact, you may have even heard bits and pieces of this speech somewhere, somehow. Uh, I'll quote it and just see if you've heard bits and pieces. In this speech, he starts saying, I'm speaking you, to you today not as a Massachusetts man, not as a northern man, but as an American. Have you ever heard like bits and pieces of that? Not as a Massachusetts man, not as a northern man, but as an American. So he's like trying to bring everyone together. And he technically does. And then there's John Calhoun. What's his idea for compromise? They say he was so old and like couldn't even stand up and he's like writing notes to an aide and the note are like telling the aide what to say on the floor of Congress. And Henry Clay's like, well, let's just have two presidents. One can be from the North and one can be from the South and then they can veto each other. It's like, that's probably not gonna work. But they're trying. They're trying to get a compromise made. So they're working this thing out for months. That's kind of the point of this compromise. It's taken time, yet there's opposition. These guys clear? The senatorial giants, the old timers, all close to death? Well, here's the young guy who doesn't look too young here. That's William Seward, the young guard. William Seward doesn't want to compromise. William Seward is like, eh, forget you, South. You want slavery? Slavery's bad. I'm not going to compromise with you guys because you want slavery. So William Seward quotes the higher law. What could the higher law be? The Bible. He is motivated by the Second Great Awakening. So if you think about the timing of it all, we're in 1850, that religious revival did take hold, and he is religiously minded where he's like, there's a higher law than the Constitution, and God would condemn slavery. So he's like, I'm not compromising with you, South. So there's that roadblock, there's this obstacle where there are some in Congress that will not tolerate slavery anymore. By the way, this guy will be really important. He'll be Lincoln's Secretary of State, and he eventually buys us Alaska. So you may have heard of Seward somewhere, but he'll come back. Good with this? Who's the president? Yes. How old are we talking when uh, Calhoun and Webster are? They're in their 70s. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they look like death, but oh. again, that's 18, 50s, you don't live that long. That's 70s. But anyway. Hey, help me out. Who's the president during all of this? No, Taylor. Taylor. So here's the trick. Taylor says, I don't care what you guys are going to do, I'm going to veto it. Yeah. So all of this, you know, congressional work, all this compromise, they're going to run into a major obstacle because Taylor said, eh, California wants to be free? Let them be free. That's not the job of Congress, that's a different role. So Taylor's like, yeah, I'm gonna veto whatever you guys do. And then Taylor's out in the sun kind of all day and then decides to relax one July night by eating uh, a bowl of cherries and like a big pitcher of milk. And then he gets food poisoning and dies. What? Seriously. Some suggest it. There are conspiracy theories out there How thinking you? that whatever happened, but food poisoning, Taylor's old, he dies, this guy takes over. And you're like, Man. Wait, did he die before or after he vetoed it? During. He was about to veto, and then he got the food poisoning and died. So he dies, this guy takes over, and I'm gonna give you his name, and you'll be like, I've never heard of him, I didn't even know this guy was a president. That's Millard Fillmore. Have you heard of Millard Fillmore? Anyway, Millard Fillmore, he was fine with a compromise. He puts his stamp on it, it's approved, it goes through, the compromise is done. You're not going to have much in your Millard Fillmore section other than he approves the compromise of 1850. So, if you want a fun fact about him, he creates the Humane Society. If you're an animal lover, thank Millard Fillmore. So, how many years were left in Taylor's this was in 1850, so he serves until 1852. There's another election. Okay, so, so he's got a couple years, and then he actually tries to run as like a know-nothing candidate in the 1850s. So you'll hear of Millard Fillmore maybe one more time. Anyway, let's look at the compromise. Let's break this thing down. The North gets a good deal. They got California. That is a huge prize. They got California as a free state, meaning the North now has control in the House and the Senate. Way to go north, you got the big prize. 
they also get this. That's kind of a big prize. Remember, like the, the map of Texas had a big old like blob to the west? Like Texas looked funny? All the blobby area in the west went to New Mexico. New Mexico didn't have slavery yet. So it's taking away slave territory, which is a pro-Northern thing. You got that map in your mind? Okay, hopefully you do. So anyway, the territory in dispute, the blob, goes to New Mexico, away from the slave-holding Texas. And then they also ban the slave trade in DC. Not slavery, slavery's still allowed, but the slave trade is banned. So, eh, whatever on that point. I'll give you a second to catch up. And I think you know what the South gets. Texas. Texas already was there. Texas had slavery. South gets a big prize. At least they think it's a big prize. It's what they wanted. The South is fearful of losing <laughs> slaves to the North. So the big thing the South gets is a fugitive slave law a tough fugitive slave law, a harsh fugitive slave law that will allow Southerners to go into the North and take their fugitive slaves. It's basically so tough where they can go into the North and find a black person and say that they were a slave and bring them back to the South. And by the way, how many slaves were actually escaping to the North? Like a thousand a year, out of four million. But that's what the South want, that's what they got. And they also open up a bunch of territory to popular sovereignty, which could potentially be a prize for the South. Mm -hmm. What was that line saying that nothing north of it could have slavery? This is basically doing away with 3630, because Utah geographically is north of it. So the logic of popular sovereignty is like, well, let's just let the people decide. And if the people want slavery, they can vote for slavery. Utah was north of 3630, so this is eroding away that old Missouri compromise. Yes. Isn't Utah Mormon? Yes. At this point? Yes. And they wanted slavery? No. But? It makes it possible. Oh, okay. And that, that potential is what made the South want it. But logic would tell you Utah would vote it down anyway. But the South is like, ooh, popular sovereignty, it's possible. And by the way, popular sovereignty is going to be an outright disaster. The idea behind it sounds great for Congress because it's like, well, let's just let the people decide. But when you let the people decide over slavery, war breaks out. In fact, that happens in Kansas, as you'll see tomorrow. Have you ever heard of Bleeding Kansas? Kansas-Nebraska Act? That's what happens when popular sovereignty is implemented. So it is not like a magic pill that solves everything. It leads to disaster. Okay. That's what it looks like. You can see above 3630, California free, the blobby area of Texas, now it's more defined. Check, good, North gets the better deal. Hey, meanwhile, we've got an election. Another kind of no-namer. Like, what, who's this guy again doing the pose with the hand in the shirt? Looking cool, I guess. Democrat, winner, do you know him? Not Buchanan, he's 1856. Uh, both this guy and Buchanan are near dead last of all presidential rankings because the divide between the North and the South is growing so much under their watch. This is Frank Pierce, who was known to be an alcoholic who would sometimes get so intoxicated he would fall off his horse. So there's that. They sometimes called him a doe face because he lived in the North but he was a pro-Southerner. So he's a pro-South Northerner. Weird, I know. But he doesn't do anything. He's like weak and indecisive and he's like, eh, okay, whatever. You guys do your thing. I'm just sitting here. So just think of that chasm, that huge pit between the North and the South. It's getting bigger and deeper and there is no band-aid that is going to fix this thing. That divide is, you know, growing and growing and growing and will get worse under Buchanan as you'll see. Looking okay with this? Now here's the thing. You actually learned something last year about what he accomplished. You're like, what? I didn't learn about Frank Pierce last year. There's an international thing with Japan that happens under his watch <clears throat> that I don't really teach yet. I teach it more when I, when I cover imperialism. 
but there is an international thing with Japan that he orders. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? It's Matthew Perry. Vague recollection <laughs> to world history when we force Japan to trade with us. We send Commodore Perry over to Japan. Don't stress this too much. I teach it later with imperialism, but this is an order by Frank Pierce. Frank Pierce is like, make Japan trade with us. And we give them an ultimatum. If they don't want to trade with us, we're about to go to war. So we kind of teach this with the imperialism unit. And then we say, oh, this is the very first example of American imperialism. I'm like, no, it's not. This is not the first example of American imperialism, of us bullying around another country for more territory or for profit. In fact, look at Native Americans. Didn't we bully them around for territory? So it's like, no, this is not the beginning of American imperialism. You can argue our country has always been imperialistic. I'll make that case later. Just if you're looking for something in your binder of what this guy does, things are getting bad but he is increasing our economy by making Japan trade with us. Could you say this was the first example of international imperialism? Or could you argue Native Americans were like a different country? Or was Mexico a different country? That oh, we, yeah. So that's the whole thing. We'll talk more on that later. But meanwhile, let's look at the Whig loser. He's the last <laughs> Whig. Do you know him? Look at his picture. He's a military man. He's another hero of the Mexican-American War. It's Winfield Scott. He's your last Whig candidate. And again, he's a perfect Whig candidate because they'll be like, hey, Winfield Scott, what's your position on slavery? They'll be like, I'm a war hero. Hey, Winfield Scott, what's your position on the bank? I'm a war hero. You get why the Whigs have to do that? Because they're so divided they can't talk politics. But they're so divided by 1852, there's nothing bringing them back together. Jackson's dead, the conscious Whigs already left, some of the Southern Whigs join the Democrats, the Whigs get whooped, and this is their very last election, the Whigs are dead by 1852. So it's the end of the Whig party, and now you're thinking, ooh, I could do this fun flow chart starting from the beginning, explaining the evolution of politics up to 1852, could you? APers get to do that all the way to like, 2016-ish, but maybe you could do this? Yeah. Think about starting in 1776 when we're all American, and then there's something that happens that starts to divide us. We're all American when we declare independence, but then, ooh, the Constitution emerges, and you have, like, anti-federalists and federalists, and then the anti-federalists become Democratic Republicans. So we have that two-party system of Democratic Republican and Federalists until, poof, what kills the Federalists? Then you just have Democratic Republican, Democratic Republican, ooh, air of good feelings. But then there's Jackson. Jackson starts to split it into Democrat and Whig. So we go 20-some years with Democrats and Whigs. Whigs, poof, disappear here. Do we go back to an era of good feelings? What party replaces the Whigs? plain old Republicans. The Republican Party will come out of the ashes of the Whigs and they'll bring in some other groups as well. So the Republican Party by 1854 is a thing. That's good to know. You don't necessarily have to do this. On the AP test you might, but you're in Dekush, so have that Dekush moment. Anyway, that's what it looks like. Just about done, let's just dig into the technical parts of that fugitive slave law. And this thing is harsh. This thing backfires on the South. In fact, the North openly violates it, ignoring the provisions of the Fugitive Slave Law. The North is like, hey, fugitive slaves, come here and we'll protect you. So the North is defying the Fugitive Slave Law, passing personal liberty laws, especially in Massachusetts, hotbed areas of abolition. The North is welcoming runaways. Well, that's not what the Fugitive Slave Law was intended to do, but that's how the North interprets it. In fact, somebody important writes a book in direct response to the Fugitive Slave Law. Thomas Paine. <laughs> Ugh, not Thomas Paine. He's dead. Who's the little lady 
That's Harriet Beecher Stowe. That's her motivation. Harriet Beecher Stowe writes Uncle Tom's Cabin in response to the Fugitive Slave Law. So that's what I mean by that. You with me? What's the South get? Like, what's in it for them? Oh, they're kind of getting cruel. They're saying, well, slaves are not allowed to testify, and they can't even get a jury trial. So there could be abuses left and right. There could be cases of rape. There could be outright murder. There, there could be a legit kind of you know, reason for your freedom. It doesn't matter. They're not going to listen to you now. So that's problematic that it's passed and now written into the law. And that will later carry over into how African Americans are not even allowed on a jury well into the 20th century. So, ugh, bad, corrupt. Look at this. So let's say there's a runaway slave, and you get slave catchers from the South that say that person was a runaway. Well, now the judge has got to determine if the person is free or an actual runaway. The judge is paid more if they find that person a runaway. They're paid less if they find that person to be free. Does that seem right to you? No, it makes people more inclined, especially if you're looking to line your pockets, they're going to find more people guilty as runaway slaves returning them to the South. Kind of messed up there. And then it also says Northerners that help are going to jail. The North knows that, they don't care. So the North is digging in, the South is digging in, we're at kind of a point of no return now. So it's going to get worse as we go. Is that making some sense? Okay, almost done. I think I just have one more thing to mention, but you already know about it. Can I go? Or you need me? Can I go? 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 I went. Okay, it again inspires her. She writes her landmark book. It's published in direct response to the compromise to the fugitive slave law. And let's just briefly note what it does. Like if you had in a simple sentence to explain the impact of the book, what's it do? Well, I would say it changes people's public opinion. Where people might have been indifferent, now they're not. And if you read that book, it pulls at your heartstrings. You feel for Uncle Tom. You're like compelled, almost kind of on a you know religious basis, to have sympathy for uh, the runaway slaves, and you want to condemn those nasty plantation owners like Simon Legree. So it has a profound impact. In fact, it makes people want to fight. So you could have been on the fence. Now you are a super abolitionist and you're willing to fight for a cause. Is this book selling? Yes, yeah, the best-selling book. It's actually the second best-selling book. The only thing beating it is the Bible. But that doesn't factor in the Uncle Tom plays. So yes, people read that book, but then every single town has an Uncle Tom play. Some of you have that chapter, you'll see how influential those were. So yes, this book does a lot. We'll kind of, you know, get that when, when you guys present, but that's what you need to know. It does a lot, blah, blah, blah. That's supposed to be Simon Legree. If you get to that chapter or if you have to do a character analysis on Simon Legree, you'll see how bad he is. Anyway. That's that. That's as far as I needed to get today. I've got some questions and I've got some help for you. You get a vocab lesson on number one. You're like, what? Was popular sovereignty a what? Oh, he did not pass them back yet. So I'll help you. You need my help on a couple of these, I figure. On number one, you see the weird word? Was popular sovereignty a panacea? A what? That would be like a cure-all, a magic pill. If one thing is done, it solves everything. Is popular sovereignty going to solve everything? No. Holy cow, no. Popular sovereignty will make things worse. But it sounded so great for Congress. Congress is like, takes the pressure off of us. Let's just let the people decide. 
And again, when the people try to decide over slavery, they end up fighting, and it leads to civil war. So no, it's not a panacea. It is not a cure-all. It is not a magic pill. But Congress loved it because it took the pressure off of them. And wait till you see how bad it gets when I teach you Kansas, Nebraska tomorrow. That look okay? And you learned a word today. Yay. Two, I think you can do uh, significant detail, compromise 1850. And the, my recommendation for this, you're using the chart to answer. You just took notes on it, but now challenge yourself. So be like, I'm going to shake out my brain and see what I retained. And then go back and use your crutch. But shake out your brain first and see if you know the pro-north, the pro-south components of 1850. And then go back and fill that in. Good. The next one, yes, I think you can do it. My final question's tough. So just look really quick, and I'm going to put some hints up here, and then I'll wrap things up. But my final question, look, assess the moral arguments and political actions of those opposed to the spread of slavery for each of these. So this column is moral arguments. That column is political action. Here are my hints. Moral arguments, political actions, I know that's tough. I'm not going to outright answer every part, but I put these hints for you. So like moral argument addressing Missouri, it's like there was this moral plan that would have phased out slavery. I'm hoping you remember that plan. If you don't, you might have to like talk to each other. Yeah, I'll, let you, I'll let you guys do it. And then. I think Thomas Jefferson also said something pretty important addressing the, the moral complexity of slavery. In fact, you could probably use two TJ quotes. Are you kind of remembering? If not, you might have to talk to each other. Uh, the... So I'll, I'll let you guys do that. And then political actions, I'm looking for the number line. You know the number line. And then there's a new state created. I think you know that one. So moral, political. This is somebody who I mentioned today, HDT. He does something morally against the Mexican-American War. So I'll let you guys figure this stuff out. Those are my hints. I'll leave it at that. 10 minutes? Seven minutes? How long are we in here? Oh, you got plenty of time. Look at all that time you have. 10 minutes. Good? Seventh period, work. <laughs>